Thank you, John. Can uh, you all second, hear me? Just a second before you begin. Okay. I'm not sure. Thank you, John. Can you all hear me? He's starting the recording again. <laughs> Uh, well, it's an honor to be here. After I heard that introduction, I thought that must be somebody else. It doesn't sound like me. Um, at any rate, uh, it's an honor to be here, and uh, uh, I look forward to talking about this subject. <clears throat> I've had to do some forgiving in my life. I think we all have to. And um, I'd like to start with a little story. <clears throat> uh, a woman bought a parrot, which insulted her and would always peck at her. One day she got angry and picked it up as it continued with the insults, you're ugly, I can't stand you, and it pecked at her again. She opened the freezer door, threw him in, and closed the door. From inside, the parrot went on for about five seconds and then suddenly stopped. She thought, oh no, I killed it. She opened the door and the parrot said, I'm very sorry, I apologize for my bad behavior and promise I will never do it again. It was an especially articulate parrot. <laughs> uh, well, okay, she said, I forgive you. And the parrot said, well, thank you. Then looked back at the freezer and sheepishly said, but why didn't you forgive the chicken? <laughs> Today, we will discuss true forgiveness. That is the parrot, not the chicken. I'll be giving this from a Christian perspective but I think you'll find that it, uh, probably 98% of it is applicable regardless of your, of your faith belief. There are only a couple areas that uh, might not be quite on, but uh, if you'll bear with me. Um, it's, this presentation is entitled Forgiveness and Healing, and the forgiveness is because of what Jesus said, Lord, if my brother sins against me, how often must I forgive him? As many as seven times, Jesus answered, I say to you, not seven times, but 77 times. Now, when I first was reading that, I always thought that, uh, boy, did that many people hate me, or did I hate that many people? Uh, but the truth is, uh, it's not 77 people, it's the same person usually 77 times. You think you forgive, and then it happens again. So, um, basically, what I want to talk about here now is to go into the outline of the presentation. It'll be in four parts. We're going to cover scientific research, the forgiveness stages, personality types, and then we'll have a guided meditation. Um, I'll probably break after the first three, give a short break for uh, whatever you want to do, including moving the car, which I'm going to have to do from the one lot but to the other. But it's going to be difficult when you come out of the one uh, lot, you can't go left. So I might even park in the street. I don't know if they'll tow me, but whatever. Well, that's not true. You can go out both sides. You can go out this, this entry. You can go out both ways. Oh, you can? OK. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's explained it. Um, first, uh, the uh, scientific research I'll be covering. Then we're going to talk about the practical stages of forgiveness that everyone has to go through, but may not recognize that they're going through these stages. Uh, then the personality types. Uh, different types of personalities tend to get stuck in different stages. And finally, finally we'll go through a guided meditation. Um, the published uh, resources that um, uh, I'm using and referring to the most are the Handbook of Forgiveness by Everett Worthington. And this is probably the classic for research. And it's sitting on the table up here in the front. Uh, the, the second is a, the Process of Forgiveness by William A. Manager. He's a Trappist monk, uh, and I spent some time at that Trappist monastery. And his book here is in front, too. In fact, I just talked to him uh, yesterday. He's about 80 years old and going strong. Uh, the third book is Don't Forgive Too Soon. Wonderful title. Um, by a Jesuit priest and his brother and, and sister. and. Uh, and it's also up here. The cover looks a little bit like a child's book, but I can assure you it's not a child presentation. <clears throat> and then behind those are some other books on um, forgiveness. And probably my favorite is The Return of the Prodigal Son by Henry Nouwen. Uh, it's more of an inspirational book rather than a um, um, 
the kind of subject we're going to be going here today, but I would highly recommend that. Now, there are obstacles in forgiveness. Um, George, uh, General Schwarzkopf said to a reporter when asked about the role of forgiveness, he said, forgiving the 9-11 terrorists is God's function. Our job is to arrange the meeting. Well, actually, forgiving is our job. Uh, and uh, the Lord's Prayer tells us, tells us that. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. And it's hard because it's counterintuitive. That is, we are designed to protect ourselves, and yet we are being asked to forgive our enemy. Our religion can often heighten this contradiction <clears throat> because we think God will punish us and if we don't forgive. So being locked into this reward-punishment cycle can energize our impulse to judge others. We can also be trapped by the false societal paradigm of forgive and forget, which is, of course, impossible. As Thomas says, wrote, the stupid neither forgive nor forget, the naive forgive and forget, the wise forgive but do not forget. And, of course, the Old Testament pre preaches a primitive level of justice when it says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This can further our vengeful behavior toward our enemy. We also can get confused about the difference between forgiveness and trust. God requires us to forgive, but not necessarily to trust. God, uh, trust must be earned, basically. It may hurt us not, to not be trusted by another person, but we can only control our own actions and not those of another. So we continue to try to forgive and let the trust up to God and others. Always ready to give our enemy a second chance, but as President Reagan said, trust but verify. So with all these negative paradigms, why should we forgive? Frankly, the reason is practical and selfish. The best example is road rage. When someone cuts us off and we react then by getting, cutting them off, we can experience shaking and trembling afterwards. This is because we, when faced with this fight or fight primitive reaction, biological reaction sets in, and the body automatically produces high levels of adrenaline, thus creating extreme physical reactions. It accelerates heart and lung, inhibits digestion, and constricts blood vessels raises blood pressure and releases nutrients for intense muscular effort. In short, it causes more discomfort and suffering to us than to the other person. The strange thing is that our anger toward others isn't just limited to big events, but also to little annoyances building up over time, often with a spouse. Conversely, the way of peace is to let go of our anger and avoid confrontation wherever possible. As Mother Teresa said in the final analysis, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. But being between us and God can also lead to anger with God. Contrary to what we have been taught, it is all, it is all right to be angry with God. As long as we lose the argument. <laughs> when we think we are in control and things go well, we pat ourselves on the back. But when things go badly, we have only ourselves to blame. The solution is to let go of control and put it in God's hands. Then when things don't go well, we forgive God since we know he is still with us. Ultimately, we are like the prodigal son returning to the father with our hat in hand, looking for his loving acceptance. So I've rattled through a bunch of obstacles. And just quickly, quite often, there's this need to be victimized that gets us caught as an obstacle for moving forward. Uh, there's a continuous suffering that's going on. It's hard to get out of that cycle. Um, there's a persistent shame quite often for what may have happened to us. Um, there is a feeling that we need justice and it's not coming. Uh, we think maybe forgiveness is a, weak, a weakness, a sign of weakness, and so we get stuck. Uh, it's 
we think we we think forgiveness is going to be condoning, and we don't want to condone what this person or group did to us. Uh, we we feel like a, we have a certain amount of lack of self-respect, and that gets us caught. Uh, we are we we're worried about further abuse from the transgressor, uh, and we can't empathize with that transgressor. Um, we also feel like the transgressor should acknowledge what they did to us. And we feel like there's reparation that's needed. And we have revengeful fantasies. So, and, the, and there is a certain sense, of, sense quite often of a victim having guilt, that kind of setting. So the question is, having given this little intro, what does scientific research say about this? Because uh, we've talked about a lot of things that can be obstacles. How do we organize these things in a way that we can deal with them in a logical way and an effective way? Well, I want to review very quickly some of the research. Um, research has been conducted in four main categories. Forgiveness among individuals, among families, among nations, and in a biologi biological and evolutionary way. Um, that's a broad statement. And basically, the research I'm going to focus on here is going to be mainly between us as an individual and the perpetrator as an individual or maybe a group or whomever but at focusing on us as an individual. Now, I realize this is a long list, but I wanted to tell you that the list is humongous in terms of the research. And surprisingly, uh, prior to 1970, there was almost no research on forgiveness, surprisingly. Even the psychiatric community wasn't dealing with it the way they should have. And um, then it started to take off. And I can tell you this has been logarithmic. By that I mean each decade it doubles, triples in the amount of research. So I can only hit a few highlights. And I'm doing this in a rather uh, uh, turp way. If you look at the bottom, I said read forgiveness is less or greater when. So I, I'm a, I took mathematics, I'm sorry, I hate to use a mathematical term. So the less and greater signs are kind of an indication of this. Uh, in 83, Fowler did a study and determined that if we have an image of God that is a loving image, we have a much better chance of forgiving somebody than if uh, we have an image of God as a punishing God. Some of these things you would say, well, this is kind of common sense. I mean, pretty much intuitive. But not all the research is that way. Uh, in 93, Gorsuch and Howe uh, determined that personal beliefs enhanced forgiveness quite a bit more than church attendance. Now this was an early study, and there have been other studies on that same subject. In uh, 96, Kark and others determined that being part of a religious community enhances the ability to forgive than if you're part of a secular community. Uh, Enright and Croyle in 98, uh, that they, they really determined that to be successful in the forgiveness, the people could not get pardoning and condoning mixed up with forgiveness, that there was forgiveness, and those were separate subjects. Um, in 98, McCulloch, and by the way, McCulloch has done a lot of research. Um, McCulloch and others uh, determined quite intuitively that if you could have an empathy for the transgressor, then you had a much greater chance of forgiveness. I'm not saying this is easy, I'm saying, but it's pretty obvious. But research in scientific terms is coming to deal with quite a bit of what a lot of religious communities already kind of knew. Um, then uh, in 2001, we call it, uh, if you ruminate on the responsible person, you have a less, a less of a chance of forgiving. In other words, if you're, if you're on a broken record, and I, I like to use this analogy, but now that nobody has records anymore, I think it doesn't work so good. The needle gets <clears throat> stuck in the groove, and you just can't get out of that groove. It just keeps rotating back, and you keep 
ruminating on that transgressor, and you can't forgive under those circumstances. 2003, Lawler uh, showed that uh, if you didn't, that if you uh, did forgive, you lowered blood pressure and heart rate. There is definitely a physical correlation, and um, uh, and in most most Christian beliefs. Uh, the soul and the body are uh, are non-dualistic. That is, they're interstitial. So it's not a stretch theologically for most Christian beliefs that if you are healing the soul, you're healing the body. They they're made for each other. In 2005, Petrini, if you have a, a biological and a mental stability, you have a greater chance of healing. Obviously, if you have some mental illnesses or you're struggling with some other issues um, that are weighing on your body and your mind, that inhibits your ability to forgive, which shouldn't be any big surprise. Uh, in 2005, Sang, uh, religion teaches only forgiveness. If you have a religion that teaches forgiveness, you have a much better chance of forgiving, which would seem to be pretty obvious. But. Um, there are some nuances in that based on different religious beliefs, and we can talk about that. Uh, 2009, Krauss and Ellison, uh, you have a greater chance of forgiving if you have church attendance and gratitude. There's been a lot of research done on forgiveness and gratitude, like point counterpoint. And if you, <clears throat> if you practice gratitude for the things that you have in life and what has is, what is gone well, it ameliorates that anger and that unforgiveness and enables you to forgive. So when you go through the research, you'll see quite often forgiveness and gratitude being in a dance in terms of the healing process. And then uh, 2009 Davis and others, and this should not be a surprise, if you have a, a if the transgressor has a similar spiritual background or religious background, it's easier for you to forgive. That's why when somebody's from a different nation, culture, religion, race, or whatever, it becomes more difficult to forgive. It should be obvious. Now, this kind of thing could go on and on. I mean, this is just tip of the iceberg on the research, but it might give you a little bit of a flavor for the research. Now, sorry you saw that. I want to show you something here. <laughs> I want to tell you the story about Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage was a, um, a miner out west in the United States. And Phineas Gage, his job in the late 1800s was to plant the charges to explode the Rockaway so they could uh, explore, so they could build railroads. That was what he was doing. And if you've ever been along the highway, you'll see all these semicircle cylinders where they put blasts in, they shear the rock off so they can build the road. And those semicircle long uh, 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 vertical lines that are spaced about this far apart were actually originally tubes. And they would drill these tubes about this much in diameter and drill them about six feet deep and then charge them with explosives and then they would do those in a row they, they blow them all at the same time, shear off the rock, and they make way for the railroad. Well, his job was to plant the explosives. Well, he came along, and he, and, and before he, in his earlier life, and his whole life up until he was doing this work, he was a very kind, loving person. He, he was a family man, didn't womanize, didn't drink. He went to church all the time. Everybody, he was a pillar of society. Well, he came along to one hole, and it had already been planted with a charge. And when he ran the rod down to, to plant the charge, he detonated the explosive. And the full impact of that explosive launched the bar basically through his head. Now, it entered below the cheek and exited behind the eyeball, or went behind the eyeball and exited the, in the, in the, you know, out of the top of his head. Well, after this incident, because the wound was so clean, they were able to patch him and not have any noticeable outward sign that he was injured. Uh, 
But from that day forward, he cursed, he drank, he womanized. He was a completely different person, completely different. And with, with time, everybody was trying to figure out what was going on. And his body was exhumed about 20 years ago, and they did some um, um, scanning of his skull and determined that that rod destroyed his frontal lobes, front part of the brain. And it has since become scientifically shown that our moral judgments are actually, and our, and our spirituality is actually centered in the frontal lobes. Now that's not to say the whole brain doesn't participate, but the frontal lobes are, are the center. Um, basically, he had been robbed of that ability. Now, what does this tell you? Well, through Tom, through St. Augustine all the way through Thomas Aquinas and, and others in, in the period of centuries of developing moral theology, uh, it was pretty much accepted, it is accepted in at least my Christian tradition, but not all Christian traditions, that there is a, a culpability level that can be attributed to three things. And when we're thinking of a transgressor, we're thinking of these three things. If a transgressor does something that, an act or a mission that's morally wrong, we can determine whether it's morally wrong. We've got frontal lobes, we know what's going on. And so we can say what you did was morally wrong. But that transgressor must also have full knowledge and full freedom. If that transgressor has mental damage, which may not be have, have been caused by a physical accident like that, it may be a chemical problem or a, yeah, something that's miswired, we don't know. Only God can know in that person's brain whether that person has full knowledge or full freedom. It may be somebody that lives in the jungle and they don't have full knowledge of some of these things. It may be mental illness. The point is that, at least based on my tradition, you can never tell somebody they've sinned. You can never make a judgment that somebody's sinned because only God can climb in their head. Only God can say, ah, you've got a Phineas Gage problem. So it's important when thinking about a transgressor to think in terms of, well, what's the level of culpability? The answer is, we don't know, because we know so little about the brain. That's the science of it. Now, I want to kind of get into the forgiveness stages here. Um, Obviously, we want to start to think about the process of forgiveness because it is a process. All of those obstacles we went over were shotgun, but they're actually they form a pattern, and uh, the pattern is rather interesting. Um, and so, what we need is um, not a bunch of pious platitudes because we all know that we, we should forgive. The question is, what is the methodology or a proven technique? in order to move through forgiveness. And so to, to come to terms with that technique, we need to talk about the stages of forgiveness. And before we kind of really launch into that, I want to set kind of the tone here as to what forgiveness isn't. Because quite often, if we don't understand what forgiveness isn't, we can never hope to forgive. Um, just to clarify, forgiveness is not trust. Uh, for example, a perpetrator may need to be incarcerated. Uh, a perpetrator, uh, perhaps, perhaps somebody stole money from you, and you, you forgive them, but you don't have to trust them with your money in the future. Because forgiveness and trust are two different things. Um, forgiveness is not restitution. Uh, if somebody stole money, 
you can forgive them, but they also have to pay the money back. They have to make restitution um, for their actions. Forgiveness isn't repentance. It's not dependent on the transgressor to repent. Now, in this particular item, different faiths have different beliefs. The Christian belief system is this belief system. In fact, not all Christian denominations believe this, but my denomination does. And I'm just saying that I'm raising a flag here so I don't offend anybody else's faith beliefs. Uh, forgiveness is not a pardon. Uh, in legal terms, you're not, you don't have to pardon the person legally. Uh, this forgiveness is a process with you. It's not, it has nothing to do with the legal system. Um, forgiveness is not condoning the actions that were trans you were transgressed against, uh, what that person did. It's not reconciliation. In other words, you don't have to reconcile with the transgressor. The transgressor may be dead. We're getting back to here. Back to here. The trans it's not idealistic. In other words, there are practical health benefits that accrue to the forgiver. So it's not as if you're doing this just for the forgiven. It's not, it's, it's not public necessarily. In other words, you could make a, a, a public statement of forgiveness like the Quakers did back when that, uh, those killings took place some years ago. But that's not absolutely necessary. It can be private. Forgiveness isn't selfless because the main benefactor is the, forgive, the, the forgiver, not the forgiven. It is not instantaneous. It takes time. It takes practice. It is not forgetting. You will always remember the transgressors act against you. And that memory will never go away because we're human which gets back to the scripture I quoted 77 times. That's why we have to go back 77 times, because you're going to always remember. Forgiveness is not forever. It must be repeated. But I can assure you that with practice that we're going to be going through today, every time <coughs> forgiveness is given, it gets easier. It, it's like playing a piano. You don't sit down and play Rachmaninoff. You just, you have to practice. And the more you practice, the more it becomes part of your subconscious. And when that thought returns, you can more instantaneously forgive. So it's not that you go, you, you can do this once. You've got to practice it. But pretty soon the forgiveness becomes so instantaneous that as soon as that thought comes back to the, of the transgressor, you forget that. Or I should say, forgive that. Um, and I keep talking about the transgressor as if it were an individual. But if you have, if you have, you can also have a transgressor that's a group. Okay. Um, and I call these the prejudicial isms. Um, and by the way, some of these are defined in like three or four different definitions. You have to pick the right one in the dictionary. Okay. Um, prejudice is really taking the acts, many times taking the acts of one or a few and condemning the group that they come from, totally. And so we can, we can understand that in terms of racism and sexism. I mean, we kind of understand as a society that that's what prejudice is. We don't often hear the name, hear the word religionism. But I see a lot of that today, and it's never identified as one of the isms. You're taking the acts or omissions of a person from a particular faith and condemning the whole faith or the whole denomination. And it happens. Uh, nationalism, same way. Uh, somebody in a particular country or group in a particular country or do radical things, and then you condemn the whole country. The same for cultures. So when we get into this process of forgiveness, you may be forgiving, uh, attempting here to forgive, and not an individual, but an organization. Okay, having said that, 
we'll get into the practical stages. Question? Will there be a time for questions? I'm sorry, what? Will there be a time for questions? Um, well, I mean, we could. Uh, you want to ask something right now? Let's ask it right now. Well, I'm not sure that I understand the point two and point three under forgiveness. If a person has cheated you and there's been no restitution and no repentance, you still forgive? Is that what you were saying? Yeah. And if you've been harmed, you keep on going into the same situation no. and forgiving no. 70 times? Well, no. I think, I, I don't mean to cut you short, but I think these stages will help you. Okay. And then I think that'll answer the question. And if it doesn't, then we'll come back. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. The title of Lynn's book, which is one of these here, is Don't Forgive Too Soon, captures the fact that forgiveness is a process and we cannot skip or rush each stage of that process or we won't realize the liberating joy of forgiveness. The stages of forgiveness are the same stages that Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross identified as the stages of dying. Um, she noticed this in patients and she wrote a book about it. It turns out those same stages are the same stages we're going to talk about now for forgiveness. Basically, they pass through five stages of grief. Furthermore, movement through the stages is enhanced if we have a loving, listening companion along the way. So let's review the five stages of forgiveness, namely denial, anger, bargaining, guilt, and acceptance. And the answer to your question is buried in one of those. We'll get to it. In this way, we can examine what we may be going through or will go through to arrive at genuine forgiveness and inner peace. As we discuss these stages, think of a specific person or group that you are angry at and self-evaluate which stage you believe you are currently in. And it may be more than one stage. You may be vacillating between two stages. The first stage is denial. I don't admit I'm hurt, but what time, with time, I let myself be loved until I'm ready to face the pain of the hurt. Gradually, we stop pretending that nothing happened and start claiming and caring for our hurt as we recognize that the person is the oppressor and we are the victim. Not admitting our hurt can be a subtle thing. While raising our families, we can often get mad at our children or spouses for frivolous things while the real reason is deeper and much more fundamental. Yet we can remain in denial of that reason. Sometimes that reason lies in the subconscious and can be coaxed out only through the practice of contemplative prayer. Uh, even forgiving self can enter into that. When we are in denial, we often relapse into our favorite addiction, namely self-pity. We overreact to frivolous things and become easily impatient. Denial is a healthy stage because it allows us to not be overwhelmed by too much pain until we are ready. However, if it goes on too long, then we can get stuck and not move to the next stage. The next stage is anger. This is the one I think we're all pretty good at. It is their fault that I am hurt, but with time I want to change you so you are not an oppressor and I am not a victim. Mark Twain spoke of anger when he said, in certain trying circumstances, under urgent circumstances, desperate circumstances, profanity furnishes a relief denied even to prayer. <laughs> he had it. He had it. <laughs> I know that. As we move through anger, we gradually consider the person less as our oppressor and more as an essentially good person capable of wonder and worthy of compassion. Once we recognize and admit the hurt, we either go on the counterattack, sometimes by being vengeful, or we swallow the abuse rather than listen to the anger. This is the classic fight or flight response. The fight can take the form of intellectual or physical response, sending emails or making threats. The flight 
could take the form of avoidance or absence, missing meetings or not returning phone calls. While we are angry, we often display passive aggressive behavior, forgetting people's names. We speak in absolutes such as always, never. Anger can be a healthy stage in that it recognizes that injustice. As St. Thomas Aquinas said, virtue consists in being angry at the right person for the right reason and for the right amount of time. However, anger can be unhealthy spiritually and physically if we get stuck in it too long. Being an angry ultimately does not hurt the person we are angry at, but ourselves. Science has shown that those stuck in the anger stage are seven times more likely to die by age 50. Hostility scores a better predictor that, of death. Bob, repeat that statement. Yeah. Science has shown that those stuck in anger are seven times more likely to die by age 50. Hostility scores are a better predictor of death than cardiac illness, smoking, high blood pressure, or high cholesterol. Physical exercise, letters to the offender, and confrontation without blame can help. Sometimes even confronting God can help. As General Colin Powell once said, get mad, then get over it. Did this thing kick on and then kick off? Stage three, bargaining. I want you to do certain things before I will forgive you. This may address your question, sir. We set up conditions to be fulfilled before we are ready to forgive. But with time, we discover what we need in order to stop being the oppressor and what we need in order to stop being the victim. Lynn's tell us in that book, needs are not necessarily bargains for forgiveness. However, bargaining often starts when we mentally construct what we would like to have from the offender in order for us to forgive them. For example, we may say that if they promise not to gossip about us in the future, we will forgive them for having done so in the past. Signs of this stage can include wanting compensation, changes in behavior, or the offender suffering the consequences. This is a healthy stage. It helps define the real problem and the need to set boundaries. Science has shown that if we can work through the bargains to get to unconditional love, we physically become healthier. In one study, for example, after watching a movie of Blessed Mother Teresa lovingly care for dying babies, the observers had a rise in immunoglobulin A, which fights colds and infections. However, staying too long in this stage can result in an imbalanced bargain such that we become enablers for future abuse. Help can come from the advice of an objective third party, from us writing an ideal apology letter to ourselves. And finally and ultimately, recalling a time when we similarly hurt someone else and they forgave us unconditionally. Fourth stage, guilt. It's my fault that I'm hurt, but with time I want to change myself so I am not a helpless victim. As our guilt and shame heal, we gradually feel less like helpless victims and more like essentially good, though fallible people worthy of respect. Sometimes in hindsight we may think we interpreted an email incorrectly, even though we originally correctly identified the offender and assessed the bargain we now have some misgivings about our earlier judgment. We may realize we similarly hurt others or that we overreacted during the anger stage. Now, instead of blaming the offender, we start to blame ourselves. Signs of this stage include loss of sleep, strange eating habits, and oversensitivity to criticism. This can be a healthy stage in that it gives us a better balance in not accusing the other person for everything but taking on some responsibility. We can then have more empathy for the offender. However, staying in this stage too long can cause a shift from feeling guilty to being depressed, even potentially clinically depressed. What can help us is physical exercise, listening to calm music, more sunlight, 
and daily assessment of our true blessings in life. Gratitude. Fifth stage, acceptance. I look forward to growth from the hurt. And with time, whether I discover a creative solution or not, and whether it works or not, I will no longer treat you only as an oppressor or myself only as a victim. Blessed Mother Teresa said it correctly. In the final analysis, it is, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. She also said, if you judge people, you have no time to love them. Each one of them is Jesus in disguise. She was brilliant, I'm telling you, one of my favorites. Signs of this stage include more often feeling peace and wholeness, sleeping better, being willing to risk criticism, and saying yes more often. This is a healthy stage with no unhealthy side. This is the stage in which we always want to be stuck. Science tells us that if we are in this stage, example, kiss our spouses, Every morning before going to work, we have better circulation, digestion, sleep, and live an average of five years longer. Science, not religion. So there are five stages, the first four of which can we, we can get stuck in, the final we don't want to be stuck in. But it seems we get stuck in the same stage all the time, which is unique to each of our individual personalities. Let us examine ourselves to see how we can avoid being stuck too long in one or more stages. There are nine personality types as described by what is called the Enneagram, which explains why we behave the way we do, or helps explain. It can be an important tool to help ourselves in our spiritual journey through the forgiveness process. Most people are a blend of more than one type of personality. We will now review these personality types as we do. I ask each one of you to try to identify which one or more of these personality types best describes you. Now, before we go on, we got the stages. Denial, anger, bargaining, guilt, acceptance. Think about that a little bit. You're probably in more than just one. You'll, you'll oscillate back and forth. If, if you're here today, you're probably not in one. You kind of already know there's a problem, perhaps, I don't know. But you might be a denial. You may be misdirecting your anger. So think about what we talked about, kind of think where you might be, because it'll lead us into something else. The nine personality types. As described by the Enneagram, most people are a blend of more than one personality. We'll now review these, and I ask you as we're reviewing them, to also start to think about which one of these personality types you may be. Because in a way, only you or perhaps a close loved one would be able to, to know. The first type is perfectionists. Perfectionists are realistic, conscientious, principled, and principled. They strive to live up to their high ideals. At their best, they are ethical, reliable, productive, wise, idealistic, fair, honest, orderly, and self-disciplined. At their worst, they are judgmental, inflexible, dogmatic, obsessive-compulsive, critical of others, overly serious, controlling, anxious, and, and, and jealous. Perfectionists often get stuck in the anger and guilt stages, and they're there too long because they are overly critical of others for what they did to them and to hurt them. And guilt that they didn't live up to their own unrealistically high standards. Second type helpers are warm, concerned, nurturing, and sensitive to other people's needs. At their best, they are loving, caring, adaptable, insightful, generous, and enthusiastic. At their worst, they are indirect, manipulative, possessive, and overly accommodating and demonstrative. Helpers often get stuck in the anger stage, feeling like a victim, because they are subconsciously unhappy with their help. Third type is achievers, are energetic, optimistic, self-assured, and goal-oriented. 
At their best, they are confident, industrious, efficient, and practical. At their worst, they are deceptive, narcissistic, pretentious, vain, superficial, vindictive, and overly competitive. Achievers spend more time in the anger stage feeling like victims because they can't seem to achieve their goals. And because they can be narcissistic, they blame others rather than themselves. Romantics have sensitive feelings that are warm and perceptive. At their best, they are compassionate, introspective, expressive, creative, intuitive, supportive, and refined. At their worst, they are depressed, self-conscious, guilt-ridden, moralistic, withdrawn, stubborn, moody, and self-absorbed. Romantics often get stuck in the denial stage because they don't want to see that things are not always romantic. They also often get stuck in the guilt stage because they are more self-conscious. Just a side note, these are for self-evaluation. Don't get caught in going, <laughs> that guy or man or woman or group that I'm angry at, they're in this group. It's not about them, as Mother Teresa said. It's about us and God. So keep thinking about what am I in. Fifth stage our fifth personality type, observers, have a need for knowledge and are thinkers, introverted, curious, analytical, and insightful. At their best, they are persevering, it's sensitive, warm, objective, perceptive, and self-contained. At their worst, they are intellectually arrogant, stingy, stubborn, distant, and critical of others, unassertive, and negative. Observers, or thinkers, can get stuck in denial, bargaining, and guilt and recycle through those sta stages several times due to over-analysis. They need to spend more time in the anger stage. Bet you never heard that <laughs> recommending being angry. You gotta do it, you know? You gotta spend some time there. Not too long. <laughs> Six type questioners are responsible, trustworthy coordinators and value loyalty to family, friends, groups, and causes. At their best, they are likable, caring, warm, compassionate, witty, practical, and helpful. At their worst, they are hypervigilant, controlling, unpredictable, judgmental, paranoid, defensive, rigid, self-defeating, and testy. Questioners or coordinators can get stuck in the guilt stage because they are paranoid and self-defeating. Seventh personality type adventurers are energetic, lively, and optimistic. They want to contribute to the world. At their best, they are fun-loving, spontaneous, imaginative, productive, enthusiastic, quick, confident, charming, and curious. At their worst, they are narcissistic, impulsive, unfocused, rebellious, undisciplined, possessive, manic, self-destructive and restless. The adventurers or optimists can get stuck in the denial stage and keep the other stages and skip the other stages since they are always positive and rationalize that forgiveness isn't necessary. This can bring out the worst in them such as rebelliousness and restlessness. I guess you're noticing there are positive and negatives to each one of these personality types so isn't that wonderful? can't say, oh, I'm going to pick that one because it makes me feel really good, you know. So there's a negative side to it. Eighth type, asserters are self-reliant, self-confident, and protective. At their best, they are champions, direct, authoritative, loyal, energetic, and earthy. At their worst, they are controlling, rebellious, insensitive, domineering, self-centered, skeptical, and aggressive. The asserters are champions can get stuck in the denial stage due to a refusal to admit self-inflicted wounds, such as insensitivity. They can also spend more time in the guilt stage in order to get to self-forgiveness. And finally, the peacemakers are receptive, good-natured, good and supporters, and supportive pacifiers who seek union with others in the world around them. At their best, they are pleasant, peaceful, generous, patient, diplomatic, open-minded, and empathetic. At their worst, they are spaced out, 
forgetful, stubborn, obsessive, apathetic, passive, aggressive, judgmental, and unassertive. The peacemakers or pacifiers can get stuck in the denial stage, since to face the problem would be too painful. The result could be anger directed at others and not at the real problem. take a few questions here for maybe five minutes and then um, we'll take a short break and then we'll come back and we'll do the meditation step. Um, any questions? <coughs> Just a comment. Yeah. Uh, if, when we go from one side to the other, uh, from the good to the bad, then we're talking I think about balance and sort of a, a, an identifying reality. So if you can identify what what is real between your Well, the exercise we just went through was, was not so much to determine where in that spectrum of good and bad you are, but to merely identify that that's the spectrum you're in. You don't have to worry about where you're at. Okay. In other words, if you're a if you're an adventurer, um, and you don't have to evaluate whether you're the good or the bad. Uh, you've got a probably a little mix of everything. Uh, so you're evaluating which of these personality types you're in. I, I'm not suggesting you should, at this point, try to determine whether the, uh, you're on the good end of that adventure or spectrum or the bad. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, no, just, yeah. But it's an exercise I think you, I mean, we all have to go through because it requires balance. Yeah. Well, yeah, John. Polar dimension uh, in psychotherapy, you often find uh, people in denial for things like, for instance, uh, you were a child and you were beaten. And you, and I, now I'm telling you from personal experience, you think, well, I deserved every beating I got. And I, you know, I did. <laughs> I was a bad guy, I, you know, a little kid, and we did all kinds of things. We got a lot of whippings. And uh, when I went through my own personal psychotherapy, uh, psychoanalysis, um, it, um, really shook me the first time the therapist would suggest that, golly, you mean big guy like that beat up on a little bitty kid and, you know, you, well, no, I deserved it, you know, so <laughs> denial is, a, is a, you're really right, you don't even, and then if you begin to own that your, you know, your own father was doing this to you, say, uh, then you do go through the stages that you described anger. So I think this is, I, I had wondered why you were putting personality types with it. I can also see, you know, my personality type and how I would perhaps do the denial stuff. So I, th I think that's interesting, really effective. I want to mention one other thing though. Um, you were speaking from a Christian perspective and you spoke of the, the, the unity between soul and body. That's also true, of course, for Judaism. It's also true for many other religions right. that they're in. And uh, I, I didn't mean to correct you, but I'm just saying. Oh, yeah. Well, it's not unique to Christianity. Right. right. I just don't want and, to get into an analysis of all the other faiths because there are some denominations that don't, okay. aren't, aren't there. Yeah, no, but I, but I just wanted to make that little point so that in case anybody was Absolutely. sitting here would think Absolutely. they weren't included because uh, many of them have that same okay. yeah. I think the only area that I find a little sensitivity in, aside from that, but there really isn't because most faiths believe in that, the only area where I might find a little sensitivity is in regard to your question, and that is uh, some faiths say you don't have to forgive unless, you, uh, unless the transgressor asks for forgiveness. Um, some faiths, and I'm not going to go into which faiths because I'm not an expert, okay? Uh, some faiths say that uh, uh, if you expect God to welcome you in, uh, the person you transgressed against has to forgive you, which is not the Christian approach that I was just describing. So without going into all those nuances about under what circumstances do you forgive, the Christian approach is you don't need the transgressor to say, I'm sorry. You don't need the transgressor to be present. They may be dead. Um, and you don't have to. Uh, you don't have to have them. Uh, if they transgressed against you, <clears throat> their salvation is not dependent on you forgiving them. But some faiths believe that. 
So I, I don't want to go there. I just, you know, I'm giving you kind of the Christian perspective, and it's applicable to a lot of different faiths. If we're going to do meditation, we probably better take our break if you want. Well, that's what I said. Yeah, we're going to take a break now. Then we'll come back for the uh, guided meditation. Okay. <laughs> So I want to, just before we start, ask a few reflective questions. First, I also want to mention why I got into this monastic out. Uh, the meditation I'm going to show you was I, I learned from a monk, and uh, this is something I use in my liturgy, but it kind of sets the tone that we're got, now going to enter into the monastery where it's a little quieter than what we're going to do. Before we go there, just the reflective questions to kind of top this off. What stage of forgiveness, forgiveness am I in? Have I truly identified who really hurt me? You notice how we're going through the stages. Do I believe it is okay to be angry even at God? What will satisfy me before I will forgive? Do I have some guilt for past react, uh, overreactions and sins? Am I really ready to move forward in freedom and joy? Which is really what results when you forgive because ultimately you are no longer eating your own flesh what's my personality type I assume you've all reflected on that or types what stage am I hung up in due to my personality and now just very briefly the forgiveness tools there are several we could could have used one is Lexio Divina which is a ancient form of meditating on scripture. I'm not going to talk about that today, but I just want to mention to you century prayer where we focus on God, and I gave a talk on century prayer here some time ago. We're not going to do that. Um, and then focus, focusing meditation. Uh, basically, this is on the body. You can think about different parts of your body. We're not going to do that. Compassion meditation is what we're going to do. And um, we're going to go through now a guided meditation. Now, as Christians and those of most faiths, we must love one another. Um, but the modern term love can be ambiguous. Uh, other terms like agape can be too foreign. And the term charity seems to have lost its meaning. So we're going to use more of the word compassion. It may capture the meaning more. Uh, it means suffering or feeling together with. Come with passion and suffering. Being compassionate to our enemies is both an act of the will and emotion. We have always been told that we must love even though we don't feel it. This is the basis for the sayings, I love her, but I don't like her. Or we have a love-hate relationship. As Christians, we don't often focus on the emotion, just the will. One way to deal with the emotion is to pray for our enemies. This makes us think of them as also needing God's love. Uh, Father Menninger, who wrote this book, gave a talk here, invited him into town, he gave a talk, and uh, he advised a woman who had been raped, and he suggested she pray for her rapist. And so she, she said that, well, I can't do that. It's too difficult. And so then he recommended that she pray for herself. And ultimately, she thought she, that led to praying for her rapist. Today, we are going to step further than just praying for our enemy in order to deal with the emotional side of forgiveness. We are going to take a journey through a guided meditation which has been proven successful in uniting both our will and our emotion. It is a three-step process. We will spend five minutes in each step. Jesus gave us a hint at this process when he said that even the pagans love those who love them. So we will capitalize on first loving those who love us. Remember to practice this daily at home since only with practice does compassion take root. Now, I might mention that there was a question that followed up after the first section. I want to reiterate it because it was a good question, and that is the 70, 70 times that we have to forgive. What I was referring to there was the, the recollection of the injury. 
every time that regulation comes back, you're going to have to forgive again. And every time, you'll go through five steps. But with practice, instead of spending 32 years on a forgiveness, which is what I did, I'm a pro at this, okay? <laughs> I can tell you about any up parts, okay, very well. What happens is you go through the five stages like that. You hear them, you feel, and your memory brings back the recollection, and you rip through those five stages subconsciously and consciously very quickly without even realizing it. If you practice this, it takes practice. And of course, remember Phineas Gage before we blame anybody, okay? That shocking picture maybe will stay with you. Phineas Gage, okay? So, I ask you to uh, remain silent and to sit straight up in your chair, feet flat on the ground, your head straight up, uh, your hands on your knees so that you don't have any muscle tightening or anything, and your eyes closed. I'm going to hit a gong three times, and then I will lead you through a guided meditation. And then at the end of the three steps, I'll hit the gong three times again. If you would like to carry the silence with you, feel free to do so. If you want to stay and ask questions or talks, I'll be here to stay and talk. Um, whether you moved your car or not may be a factor. Choose a person who has loved you. It may be someone from your past or present, living or dead. may be God or a human. It is important to choose someone you not only willfully love, but also emotionally love. Now, allow yourself to revel that emotion of love. Receive it. Relish it. Remember it. Allow it to wash over you and penetrate into your heart and soul. Now wish that person joy, healing, contentment, and fulfillment. You may mentally say something like, may you be happy, may you be free, may you be loved, May you be one with all God's creation.
now in silence, mentally and slowly repeat those wishes for the next few minutes. choose an indifferent or neutral person. This could be a casual acquaintance, someone in the news, the postman, a stranger on the bus. the same technique you used with the person you love. Transfer that love for the first person to the acquaintance. Allow yourself to revel in that emotion of love. Receive it, relish it, remember it. Allow it to wash over you and penetrate into your heart and soul. Now wish that person peace joy, healing, contentment, and fulfillment. You may mentally say, may you be happy, may you be free, may you be loved. May you be one with all of God's creation. Now in silence, mentally and slowly, repeat those wishes for the next few minutes.
now choose your transgressor. This could be someone you hate or who hates you. This could be a public person or collective persons, past or present, living or dead. family member, our business partner, an individual. Once again, contact the compassion you felt in step one. deliberately transfer those feelings to your transgressor. Allow yourself to revel in an emotion of love. Receive it Relish it. Remember it. Allow it to wash over you and penetrate into your heart and soul. Now I wish that person peace, joy, healing, contentment, and fulfillment. You may mentally say, may you be happy. May you be free. May you be loved. be one with all of God's creation. Go back as often as necessary to get in touch with those loving feelings as you wish peace, joy, kindness, gentleness, patience, and all the fruits of God. Now in silence mentally and slowly repeat those wishes for the next few minutes.